and good morning, good afternoon to you, wherever you are. We have some 100 people with us today on another pedagogy seminar. And I love doing these because I learn a lot. After teaching a few years, I've been doing that for a few years. I'm still finding that it's still, I still get excited, especially when I listen to gifted, uh, talented educators like Nuket and Philip that we have today. You know, people ask me, you know, what makes a good teacher? I think a good teacher is uh, someone who feels good just before they go into the classroom or into a Zoom video, perhaps, uh, classroom. Uh, that means you are prepared, you know your material, you have a plan uh, for the students, you thought about the pedagogy and so on. But also, I feel good when I'm trying something new. I'm experimenting with a new approach to get the material across, or I have some new materials, or I have a new method for engaging students. So that's why I think these series of webinars that we're offering over the past two months and will continue to offer for many months to come on behalf of our cyber uh, network, some 10 cybers across the United States, are valuable and and every every time we do this we get a lot of praise as well and today we'd like to encourage you to listen and ask questions and also give us some ideas for future sessions uh, through the survey as well uh, so today uh, we're going to talk about multimedia tools in teaching i think they're relevant for face-to-face -face traditional classroom teaching as well as uh, online teaching, especially synchronous online teaching. And we couldn't have better speakers to cover that uh, topic uh, than Nuket and Philip. So I'm really thrilled, Nuket, to have you here with us and Philip. Uh, I think you know a little bit about their background. I've known them for some time, especially Nuket. Nuket has been, uh, they're both, first of all, outstanding educators, but very importantly, they're innovative, creative educators. They think a lot about pedagogy, they develop tools, and you'll see uh, some of that today. Uh, so Nuket, of course, has been a long time educator, but worked in industry as well, in Turkey and in Europe, especially in marketing and communications. Uh, she is the director of the El Izi uh, communications consultancy based in London. And, and you'll hear about some of her uh, teaching methodologies that she has put together for us to use. And uh, Dr. Philippe de Bune uh, is of course, uh, is, comes from uh, KU Leuven, uh, Catholic University of Leuven. And he similarly has been an innovator in the classroom and produced a lot of materials. And I think Nuket and uh, Philippe, you, you both collaborated on a, Erasmus project over the past several years. And in fact, we'll see some of the fruits of that collaboration uh, today. Uh, so we're very delighted to have you and I'll turn the uh, forum to you, Nuket and Philip. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Hoja. Uh, it is a great honor to be here and thank you ever so much for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, we are really honored uh, to be here today. And also special thanks uh, to our participants uh, for being here. Uh, I'm sure uh, it will be a lovely session. Uh, we've been looking forward to it. Uh, as you all know, we will be talking about uh, multimedia uh, for synchronous online teaching uh, in business studies and especially in IV today, uh, together with uh, my colleague Philippe de Brou. Uh, very quickly, I would like to go over the topics that we will be covering together. Uh, mostly, we will be talking about on how to use multimedia uh, for uh, synchronous online teaching rather than why we should be using multimedia. Uh, and in that respect, we will be uh, sharing with you two standalone video case studies, uh, series. Uh, one is Brands Whispering, uh, and the other, is one, the other one is Multinationals Whispering. Uh, and uh, I will, after a very short introduction, uh, I will start talking about Brands Whispering and we'll be sharing one video case from uh, Brands Whispering series. 
Uh, and uh, then Brands Whispering was, is a, actually a web and video based ebook uh, that was developed specifically for marketing and it has been in use uh, since 2016. Then I will leave the screen to uh, Philip uh, to talk about Multinationals Whispering, which is a new video uh, case collection uh, being produced as, uh, for specifically for international business. And this is a part of an Erasmus Plus project. Philip is our project coordinator, and uh, I take part in that uh, project as a UK SME, as one of the partners. Uh, today, all our aim is to be able to use these video cases and show how to use these video cases as part of online uh, teaching. Uh, before we go any further, just for the sake of clarity, I would like to uh, mention what we mean by uh, when we say multimedia learning. And when we say multimedia learning, we mean learning from words and pictures, which I think is obvious, but as I said, just for the sake of clarity. And uh, when we say pictures, it is actually, it could be still pictures or it could be uh, moving images, uh, graphs, animations, uh, commercials, everything that goes under it. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of different uh, uh, multimedia examples that are used for teaching purposes, from films to documentaries, to commercials, to uh, executive videos. Uh, today, as I said earlier, we will only be concentrating on standalone video cases as examples. Before introducing our video case, uh, I would actually very briefly like to talk about uh, our path and how we have actually developed Brands Whispering uh, and the, uh, the literature that we made use of. As you can imagine, uh, we've made extensive use of Richard Meyer, Mayer and colleagues uh, pioneering research in the area of uh, psychology, educational psychology, starting with early 1990s. And we have been actually very fortunate because uh, Mayer and colleagues are still continuing to produce new research findings, especially on current topics such as e-learning. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you will see a list of references um, and that uh, we thought uh, actually among our participants, uh, there could be uh, colleagues who might be interested in producing their own video cases. Therefore, we've tried to include a reference list uh, that you can uh, maybe refer to if you want to. Uh, and we may use a lot of other uh, material as you can imagine while uh, putting together uh, the, the video cases, while producing the video cases. Uh, of those, uh, um, of the literature we've made use of, uh, actually we were able to isolate or identify three very important points uh, while producing our video cases. One was, uh, we said that since uh, people learn better from words and pictures than words alone, uh, we decided to end up with a video case, a standalone video case study, in order to be able to teach uh, textbook material, not as a, as a case, but as material. The second important uh, point uh, that we have identified, again, based on Mayer and Moreno's work, uh, they were uh, talking about uh, uh, factors that need to be uh, taken into consideration to be able to reduce the cognitive load while producing multimedia. Uh, they're talking about nine tips and uh, in their research. Uh, from the very start, uh, we've actually used the, their research findings and integrated their findings uh, into our own uh, video cases while producing the video cases. Last point was having a good narrative. All the research we read was talking about having a good narrative and linking that video case narrative into the curriculum because uh, the idea is not, the uh, aim is not to, to teach the case but the idea is to teach the curriculum and the textbook information. So whatever we did, we had to make sure that we have a good narrative uh, linking it to the curriculum. So all these things actually showed us that simple is more in multimedia learning and in all the video cases we have produced, uh, we actually did stick to this motto uh, very religiously. That brings me to Brands Whispering. I will very briefly talk a, lot, a bit about Brands Whispering, what it is. As I mentioned earlier, it is a web and video based ebook for teaching marketing uh, and business studies. Uh, each chapter in this book uh, starts with real life video cases, but these video cases are scripted by lecturers, knowing from the very start that they will be used as teaching material in the classroom. 
Uh, but in order to be able to have higher engagement, they are narrated by company executives uh, in 20 minute videos uh, comprised of four or five different uh, parts. Um, based on and all of them, all of these chapters are based on dilemma training. Uh, the executive comes up and talks about a problem that they face and how they solved it. Uh, and the, our aim was to create a win-win situation both for the academia and the business world uh, by producing a tool that would be that would make learning experience much much nicer for students uh, and much engage much more engaging for students and for lecturers while uh, teaching relevant material uh, to them uh, that would that they would be able to use in their business lives. Um, Brands with Spring was developed in the classroom by myself and it was first launched in March 2016 in Turkey. Uh, currently we have uh, 12, uh, 14 video cases uh, and it is a free access website. Um, and since over the last four years it's been used extensively and therefore we managed to collect a lot of anecdotal and empirical evidence. Um, uh, and all, all the evidence shows that it is working. If any of you are, is interested in the findings like Google Analytics or other metrics, I would be more than happy to share them with you. Uh, the English versions of our uh, video cases are being distributed by the case center. And at the moment, uh, we've got nine video cases in the case center's collection in English with 29 accompanying teaching materials. And we are still expanding the collection. Uh, very recently, we've uh, finished one uh, video case from Bridgestone, the international tire company, uh, looking at the robotic process uh, and uh, automation and use of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, in order to be able to increase their competitive advantage in the marketplace. Uh, so after having said that, uh, I think now we can uh, start uh, having a look at our uh, example, a video case example. The example that I will be sharing today with you from Brands with Spring is Unilever's Ox case, They're looking into global marketing strategy. Uh, you will see a, a seven minute clip uh, taken from a 20 minute video, uh, and you will see the Unilever deodorant category manager explaining how Ox was launched in Turkey with the international brand claim of female attraction. As you know, this was being used widely all around the world uh, for quite a bit. But then after 2010, uh, they realized that they had to move away from gender specific stereotyping globally. Uh, and in the case, uh, we will be seeing different shades of standardization and adaptation uh, taken by Axe uh, uh, over a 30 year period uh, with some tangible uh, trade offs in the market. In order to be able to, to, uh, to show, to exhibit how we can actually use, use these video cases uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a tool as an on, for online teaching, uh, we would like to suggest a four-step approach, uh, but this is just a suggestion. I'm sure our participants will be able to come up with other creative methods of using these, um, uh, the video case. But uh, after having tested it in a couple of uh, different environments, this is something we would like to propose. Uh, we suggest to start the uh, classes with synch some synchronous uh, online teaching first, giving background information. This is again in order to be able to have a good narration uh, and linking the video case to the curriculum and to the textbook. Uh, in order to be able to show what I mean by that, I've actually, I'll just show a, a quick uh, a example. And for the example, uh, I have taken, use international business, the new realities textbook. Uh, you can use your own, the textbooks that you're using, or if you're using articles, again, the same thing could be done. But just for the sake of example and simplicity, if we go over this, uh, the example, uh, Unilever's Ox video case is related to uh, chapter 16 uh, and the New Realities textbook, Marketing in the Global uh, Firm. Uh, and then in order to, uh, just as an example for synchronous uh, online teaching, you can refer to the textbook or the, that you're using. For example, you can talk about the framework for marketing in the international firm, uh, saying that in the video case, we will be looking at the inner circle of this uh, framework, mostly concentrating on these two quadrants, the global branding and international marketing communication. The whole idea, as you can imagine, of this uh, synchronous uh, introduction is to be able to 
uh, link the video case to the textbook and uh, to guide students uh, when, uh, before they start watching the video case. Uh, again, you can have a, a short synchronous uh, session at the beginning or a, a long one. Uh, you, if you want, you can talk about, for example, standardization and uh, adaptation as, as uh, two concepts used in, within IB context. Uh, as I said, I mean, it's up, of course, it's up to the uh, lecturers. Uh, but before we uh, start watching it, I would just, again, in order to be able to have uh, more engagement, uh, I feel that it's always a good idea to leave them with a question before they start watching the video case. So again, in order to be able to increase engagement. That brings us to the second uh, step in this online teaching with video cases, and that would be watching the video itself. That could also be synchronous, as we will uh, see today, or it could be asynchronous, again, according to your preferences. Uh, students can watch it beforehand, or if they want to refer to it after the class, they can do it. So that it's got some sort of a, a flexibility. Now we'll see these again, uh, and it's again also it's advisable to uh, to pause uh, uh, instead of just watching this video all at one go, to pause and have a discussion and then continue uh, in order to have uh, you know more lively uh, class discussions. Uh, we, for the sake of simplicity and uh, and for the sake of time, we will not have any, of course, any discussions. But you uh, uh, watch these four uh, clips uh, one after another, and then we'll see uh, the rest. Of them. Right after the video, watching the video uh, case, uh, the third step that um, uh, that can be used in the classroom uh, environment is asynchronous uh, teaching. A using making use of the audio teaching notes. As part of Brands Whispering series, we also uh, supply uh, audio teaching notes as part of the, uh, as I said, teaching material. Uh, you can also have your own uh, teaching materials. Uh, the few, uh, few charts you will hear, uh, I will not be talking, you will hear my voice, but they are pre-recorded uh, no, teaching notes. Uh, Again, this in order to be able to have some sort of a, a different uh, approach, or also have a, have a blend in the uh, in the lecture. Uh, usually, it works quite nicely. Uh, the last step uh, is uh, again after this asynchronous part, uh, you can have a synchronous uh, session, uh, having a class discussion, uh, making sure that maybe uh, if you want, your students can have uh, role-playing sessions in order to be able to have a, uh, uh, have a, a live, livelier uh, this class discussion. Or if you want, you can again back, uh, switch back to the textbook. Uh, for example, you can talk about things that are not covered in the video case, such as cost reduction advantages that we see in standardization or uh, complying with government regulations uh, under adaptation. Uh, these are the points that are not uh, touched upon uh, in the video case. Uh, I think I will stop here uh, and then uh, leave the screen uh, to uh, to Philip to talk about uh, multinationals whispering. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, also from uh, me. Um, so I wanted to share with you, indeed, um, the project that Nugat has already referred to. Um, so using video cases for online IB teaching. Uh, so my name is uh, Philippe de Beule, um from the KU Leuven in Belgium. Um, and this is an um, Erasmus Plus project, meaning that it's a European funded uh, project together with um, some other um, university partners, as well as uh, Nucat's uh, Alizi communication uh, company. So as you can see, we have uh, cases coming from two Eastern European countries and two Western European countries meaning uh, Slovenia and uh, Poland on the one hand and the UK and Belgium on the other hand. And so we also have two smaller uh, countries, uh, Belgium and Slovenia, as opposed to two bigger countries, uh, Poland and uh, the UK. This has been uh, done uh, on purpose, given that we wanted uh, to have different backgrounds to companies, meaning that as you all are well aware, of course, that the context where companies come from uh, uh, has an impact on its internationalization. That's why uh, we felt in, in the um, up, uh, setup of the uh, project, it was important to have uh, uh, pro uh, partners from the different European countries. 
Um, as this is a European um, funded project, everything is uh, open source. This means that all the video cases and the teaching materials will become available as they are developed. Um, since we've started um, 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 18 months ago, uh, we are in the process of, of developing them, uh, but they are still work in progress. So um, um, if you ask me, are they already available? Uh, the answer is unfortunately not yet, uh, but everything will become available by September 2021 in line with uh, the academic year in Europe, which you know everybody could use if they wanted to uh, for the academic year 21-22. Um, we've also set up uh, some uh, websites and social media accounts to make sure that the results can be shared. Um, so whatever it is that you like, if you like uh, traditional websites, as you can see, we have mnc.whispering.com. Uh, but of course, for the moment, as you might uh, understand, there's nothing much to um, um, uh, list yet. But we also have, you know, obviously some Twitter accounts um, and some LinkedIn account where also the information will become available. And the videos will also become available on YouTube. Uh, so they will be readily available for lectures to use all over the world. Now, why did we um, come up with this uh, plan for online IP teaching uh, using video cases? Um, because we see that more and more universities, uh, faculties and business schools, obviously, are, offer, are offering more and more online classes. Uh, um, this was an ongoing trend before, uh, but as we are all painfully aware, I'm, I guess uh, by now, uh, this has been warped because of the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis. Uh, because we've all been sitting at our uh, desk uh, talking to students online uh, since a few months. Um, and I must admit that I struggle myself um, using traditional materials. It's not very rich uh, to do these online uh, teaching or appropriate um, for online teaching. So that's why we think that uh, the, pro the project that we're doing and the, the uh, video cases that we're uh, developing will be very useful in, in this respect. And especially also for newer generations of students, um, video is the way forward. Um, so, you know, I have some uh, data here to show that uh, when we look at the different generations, um, video is actually becoming increasingly important, especially this Generation Z, um, which has just started to hit our classrooms, if you are an, in the undergraduate program. Um, but, um, of course, is only getting started, meaning that, th one, the Generation Z uh, a cohort is not, not finished yet. Um, and, um, of course, for the next 10, 15, 20 years, um, uh, they, they will be crowding our, uh, our aulas. Uh, so when you look at uh, what, they are, what they want, they don't want text, they don't want to read, uh, they don't want to write necessarily uh, uh, either. Um, and so when also when you look at the result, for instance, as a, um, uh, because of COVID, you see that millennials um, focus much more, as you can see here, on online videos. Um, and if you look at this for Generation Z, yeah, they are very much visually based. Uh, they have a video brain. Uh, so it's um, an important um, consideration to take into account when we develop um, uh, teaching materials. So without further ado, I thought that I would just show you one video case and how um, I had anticipated using it. Um, so I'm just going to show one video of four minutes, uh, which I hope uh, you will enjoy. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, through this video. I'm just going to show how indeed the case is narrated by a CEO and by the CTO um, uh, upon questions that I ask through a, a script. So I've asked them scripted questions and so they answer in line with the things that I want to demonstrate or show through this video case. Um, this is a video case of the an internationalization process of Born Global um, from a small company in Belgium. And so uh, the question that I would ask, uh, how would you internationalize or start internationalizing this company? So it's called IP, uh, which is uh, linked as well to the intellectual property as it is to the intellectual property that they have in the sanitary wear business. So it's literally not just IP of intellectual property, but also IP. Um, so perhaps when looking at this uh, video, you might ask yourself the question, which I would ask to students, 
how would you start internationalizing this company? Okay, so as you can see, this is only the first part um, of this uh, video, uh, of this series of videos on this company, uh, where we um, use this problem solving uh, procedure. So, you know, you would ask students uh, how they could conceive of internationalizing this company, and they could come up with different methodologies. You could say, oh, we have to uh, do this ourselves, we have to develop our own products, or we could use strategic alliances with other companies, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, the point is not that they get the answer right, of course, but that they just think about uh, ways in which this company could um, internationalize and the, the advantages and disadvantages of the, of the various methods. Uh, so, um, subsequently, um, what we then do is, as Nuket also indicated, is um, uh, develop, let's say, uh, what is called knowledge clips, uh, where we discuss uh, what the theories or the models that uh, are useful in this regard are and how they could be used. Um, these knowledge clips, as you understand, are also videos uh, which detail um, the theories or the models that you want to relate to the certain uh, specific uh, uh, company and how in the second, second instance they, are linked, they can be linked to the video case. So um, how do they give an answer to uh, the specific um, uh, question? For instance, in this case, of course, we could talk about the Uppsala uh, model or the internalization theory or the not network model uh, uh, to this uh, case study. Um, now, of course, uh, we're not going to go into detail on uh, the specifics of this case, given that it's an uh, educational uh, seminar and not an, uh, a research seminar. Uh, but I just want to, of course, uh, show to you that um, this is the, you know, the, 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 the way in which information can be supplied to, to students afterwards to discuss um, uh, what the company has done and what it means in terms of theory, in terms of models, in terms of frameworks. And so you see how they have done it uh, over time, of course, which builds on the various um, cases, vid uh, video case series that we developed, let's say four or five in, in this case. Um, you know, one model that you could use, as indicated, is the Uppsala process model um, uh, related to the uh, initial model or perhaps relating it to the uh, uh, later version of the 2009 model, or obviously also relating it to the uh, Born Global uh, model that is also available in, in literature. Um, you know, what we just want to show, I, I guess, is that despite the fact that it might be a Born Global, you see that there is indeed um, this process of uh, learning which um, makes the company increasingly um, uh, international increasingly able and, and willing also to do so. So this is just an example of how it could be used in, 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 in class discussion. Um, now, the way that I use it, um, I typically have students read a chapter in a textbook beforehand, because I, uh, I feel that they at least need to have some sort of theoretical or empirical background knowledge to try, try to answer these questions in class. Um, it depends, of course, a little bit on who your students are. Uh, but my students are typically perhaps uh, lacking in uh, theories, so they, I, I force them to read something beforehand. And so I use this case uh, synchronously, you could say, in class, um, uh, using, for instance, Blackboard Collaborate uh, to create teams of students to uh, come up with answers to this, uh, to this uh, question. And so afterwards, we can discuss uh, in, a, in you know, a subsequent part uh, their, their solutions, if you like, uh, of what they can, uh, came up with. Uh, but obviously, I use Blackboard Collaborate, but you can also use uh, Zoom or, or, you know, Microsoft Teams or, or Google Meet, whatever it is that your university um, uh, uh, subscribes to. Um, also, I like to relate the theory to, to the case also in class, uh, given that uh, in my um, understanding of what students get out of a case, it's often not very easy for them to, to understand what the case actually tells them in terms of theory. So. Um, uh, I, I discussed this with them in class, and of course, they can also check the knowledge, knowledge clips that uh, are developed on this case afterwards to make sure that they at least understand the theory uh, um, like they should and what it actually means in terms of this uh, video case. But obviously, you could also have students prepare part of the case study in advance and build on it in class, so you could play with different uh, uh, methods of delivery. Uh, depending on the way that, that you prefer or the way that you are accustomed to. Um, and the, the, the learning of theory could 
partially precede or even follow the case. So in this respect, I think that both uh, methodologies work, meaning uh, an inductive versus a de deductive um, approach, uh, starting from observation or starting from theory. I think that both of these methodologies are possible. And so it depends a little bit on your own uh, liking uh, what it is that, that you could choose. Okay, and with that, I will uh, end my presentation and uh, revert to uh, the Q&A, if you like. Uh, thank you so much, Nuket and Philip. You really broadened our minds and gave us new ideas. Uh, case uh, videos, video cases, is not something I use, but I'm very excited about using them in the classroom. There's a lot of questions. Uh, I guess they uh, mostly deal with the uh, uh, use uh, in practice of video cases. Uh, our colleague Arif Zaman asks, uh, what is the uh, appropriate uh, type of students? I mean, does it matter whether you have undergraduate, graduate classes? And in this case, he's dealing with low income students. So does that matter? Uh, George uh, Carniero has a related question. He says, I have about, you know, one hour class. So is that a long enough period to do the video cases? Maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience, about the ideal circumstances, uh, types of classes, types of students uh, that would lend the uh, video cases uh, to be very worthwhile pedagogical tools. Well, it was, uh, let me go first uh, to answer uh, Arif Zaman's question. Uh, as I mean, as far as I know, from my own personal experience, uh, especially with uh, students that have uh, experiences, that have work experience, these cases work much better because they can relate it uh, better uh, due to their own work experiences. Uh, when it comes to uh, low paid workers uh, and uh, undergraduate students uh, that are uh, maybe older. Uh, again, if they have for mature students uh, with uh, low income backgrounds, uh, it could be a good idea, especially if they've got some work experience, as I said, they can relate to it better. Uh, but for digital technology, uh, whether or not if they are not able to uh, have access to internet uh, at home, uh, maybe it might be a good idea to use it within the class environment. Uh, different countries, Kenya, Pakistan, in an IB class at university there. Uh, well, uh, I mean, I can talk from brands whispering experience. And I can say that, uh, for example, our cases are uh, quite popular in India uh, and, 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 and also in Pakistan. Uh, but apart from that, you know, that's all, ex that's the old experience uh, I have. I don't know what uh, Philip would like to add to it. Yeah, I think that um, in this respect, in terms of low income backgrounds, um, I'm not sure if you mean access to uh, the videos. So um, I have received many uh, emails already from people from developing countries when my videos will be ready because uh, they will be open source, so free. So students do not have to pay anything uh, for access. So I think that in that respect, it's important. Um, in terms of where they come from, uh, could of course have an impact on uh, what they find interesting. Uh, but we have some cases, for instance, from Eastern Europe, um, also where you know, contexts and institutions uh, might be different, uh, although they might not be you know, similar to, let's say, Kenya or Pakistan or Jamaica. I do think that uh, some of these uh, uh, contextual settings um, might be related by the lecture, of course, um, to the case. So I think that that's an important realization to make. Um, these cases do not run by themselves, right? I mean, uh, you are still an educator. It, it is up to you as a lecturer to use them in proper ways. Uh, so it's, uh, it's up to you to um, clarify and elucidate uh, what it could mean or what it should mean to certain students. Because I, I agree that sometimes it, this is not uh, straightforward or forthcoming. And so uh, it's true that um, uh, you as a lecturer are a little bit, let's say, the intermediary, the in-between, between the case and, and, um, uh, and, the, and the, uh, the, the students. Um, perhaps if I can already pick up on uh, George's um, uh, question about the effort it takes to uh, change a, a regular PPT into um, 
uh, uh, knowledge clip, for instance. Well, I think that the most important aspect um, is the script writing. So uh, when you typically do a, a power presentation in class, you know, we all know that we sometimes uh, make it up as we go along. Um, our, our explanation is not always crystal clear and perfect at every occasion. Um, so when you do uh, this knowledge clip, obviously it needs to be because it's going to hopefully last for some time, especially if it's uh, you know, a, a certain theory or a certain framework, you're going to hopefully use this for quite some time. Uh, so it, it does require some sort of uh, um, uh, preparation to have the script writing for these uh, knowledge clip in place. Um, and so this might take, let's say, 75% of your time. Uh, when the script is ready, and your slides are ready, then you can record them either in PowerPoint, um, and I can make available you know, a, a procedure if you like uh, on, on, on Cyber's website, uh, how to do this. Uh, you can also use, of course, uh, um, more uh, advanced uh, software that is available, for instance, uh, a program like Camtasia, which my university subscribes to, but I can understand that uh, some universities uh, uh, would not have this. But again, um, the typical uh, PowerPoint, um, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint does have this available. I, I think that also Nuket uses this uh, extensively. Um, and so uh, to prepare this uh, um, um, uh, a knowledge clip will take you some time, especially the first one, admittedly. Uh, there is some learning uh, going on, but it, it is quite steep. So once you have the knack of it, uh, you've learned it, it, it will go uh, quicker. But the first time you have to uh, take into account at least uh, a day or two to, uh, to do this. Um, it's going to take some time in the beginning. Uh, if I may add, you can, uh, if I may add just very quickly, I think the good side of it is that once it is done, you can use it many times over. Yes, you put a lot of effort maybe in order to be able to produce it in the first place, but then afterwards you can use it in multiple occasions. Yeah, and if there is enough interest, we can actually schedule another uh, session where you can talk about how you produce a new video case because you have a lot of experience, both of you, on that. Uh, there's a question from Monica Semenyuk, uh, uh, more of a technical question about blending the video case into your learning management uh, for platform. Uh, she asks, can you play video uh, during a synchronous class using Blackboard Collaborate? Yeah, that's a good question because if you use um, a PowerPoint presentation and you have to upload it in uh, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, it's true that the video disappears. Um, but you can uh, use uh, the video in a different way. But then, of course, it's not like you um, have, let's say, a um, PowerPoint with a video included in it, and you have to show the video, let, like, let's say, separately. Uh, so it's true that uh, using it in the PowerPoint is difficult in, in uh, Blackboard Collaborate, but you can use it, let's say, separately. Uh, uh, using, you know, uh, just playing the video, let's say, um, uh, using uh, Blackboard Collaborate. Um, of course, coming back to the first question that we answered, um, I think that it's important uh, to use also uh, this, the, the streaming um, um, methodology in uh, Blackboard, uh, because otherwise uh, people have to download it, for instance, and it, this takes a, a, a tremendous burden on the university system, but also on people's, um, on students' um, infrastructure. So it's better to use a streaming methodology um, uh, than you know, having this downloadable uh, video, uh, which is uh, too, too big, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about the use of transcripts? Uh, our own colleague, Murad Dartley, uses video cases successfully, but he says, his experience is that students also like to get hold of the transcripts uh, and any data sources uh, along in, in a hard copy form. Is that your experience? And is, do you, do you uh, advise that? Yes, I mean, in general, yes, especially lecturers also like to have uh, transcripts in order to be able to work over them. Uh, in our case, uh, we have actually, as part of teaching materials, we also supply the uh, PDF versions of the uh, video cases so that there's some written material to, to go over. Same with Multinationals Whispering, we will be including the transcripts of those video cases in a PDF format once they're finished. 
uh, and they will again be freely accessible uh, from multinational whispering website. Yeah, because it's, it's important to realize that in a video, you know, you sometimes see things or you hear something, but you can't remember exactly where it was at. Um, and that's the advantage also of also having transcripts of, of having, let's say, a, a, a regular textual based uh, video uh, 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 case um, next to the video case, because then you can quickly, you know, scan over the text and see what was said at what, what point. So it's easier for students uh, to find information. It's true. You know, there's not a question on this on assessment, but it comes to my mind. What has been your experience? I mean, how do you do the assessment of performance by students individually or as a team on video cases? Does it involve any complexity or do you, do you have you designed something different and new for assessment part? It could be in, done in two different ways. One is uh, lecturers can actually use their own usual way of assessing uh, without really involving the, the information given in the, uh, in the case. Because as I said earlier, the, our aim is not to teach the case itself, but to teach the textbook information. So uh, lecturers, whatever way of assessing, you know, you, they, you, they can stick to their usual way of assessing or else uh, they can actually uh, uh, ask questions uh, from the teaching notes, the audio teaching notes that I've mentioned, um, or from the knowledge clips that uh, Philip mentioned. Uh, there could be certain exam questions driven uh, based on those uh, material that, that is produced. Yeah, the, the thing that, you know, coming from Belgium, as you know, we are quite strict also, and we also have to um, get students to act because students uh, typically, uh, Flemish students are quite laid back, you know, they sit and listen, they're not very active. Um, for instance, when you form teams, they could supply you with an answer. Um, of course, this answer could be formative. Uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, check every word that they've written about, you know, uh, um, you know, for instance, relating back to my case, uh, how would you internationalize this company the first time around um, and, and in subsequent um, answers, uh, but they do need to supply me with some sort of inf uh, uh, answer. And this answer is, is recorded uh, in, you know, in uh, formally, uh, but of course I, I do not really always um, evaluate it or assess it as such. It's more of a formative uh, based uh, um, assessment, let's say. Yeah, let's say uh, maybe uh, in a few minutes we have left uh, in the design of a course, let's say a typical 14 uh, week long semester course. Uh, is there an ideal number of case uh, video cases that you would incorporate into your teaching? Of course, the variety of uh, teaching uh, tools is, is always good. Uh, blending many, many approaches and video cases is one of them. Uh, so what has been your experience? Is there an ideal number, not too much, not too few, not too many? I think it will depend on the, on the lecture and the, the profile of the students, because some students, especially in my experience, especially MBAs, they really like uh, cases in general uh, and video cases uh, these days. Uh, but maybe for undergraduates, uh, it could be wiser uh, to have maybe maximum three uh, during the whole uh, semester. Uh, but again, I think it really depends on the needs of the lecture and the, and the profile of the, of the students. I think it, for me, it will be very hard to generalize. I don't know what Philip would say. Yeah, well, um, I, I actually kind of like uh, this methodology, uh, given that in my experience, students, um, when they read a case, they haven't read it properly. Um, they often, um, you know, have to still look at the, at the text during class. So uh, I'm actually quite uh, disappointed often. Um, so I find that uh, this combination of video with also having some text, uh, which they perhaps could prepare uh, already beforehand, uh, works well. So I kind of uh, actually like it. Um, it doesn't mean that I have to spend an entire lecture on one video case, but I can use, for instance, only a, one part of it. I don't need to use the, the four parts or five parts of a video case. I could use uh, one or another. For instance, I'm developing now one with, on, on Kipling, which is you know, the, the bags uh, producer. Uh, one part is on production and you know, contract manufacturing, but another one is on marketing and sales, and a, a third one is on digital marketing. So if you only wanted to focus on one, you could, you could select one rather than go through the motions of all of these uh, uh, parts. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, that's my experience. That's been excellent. That's been excellent. Thank you. Uh, 
A heartfelt thanks, Nuket and Philip. Uh, you have really added another dimension to our teaching toolbox. She talks about launch, uh, brands launch campaign uh, using the international uh, global campaign. Axe was launched in Turkey in 1986 using our usual global Axe launch campaign. The creative idea for this international campaign was based on women finding men who use Axe more attractive. We have continued with this communication for quite some time. As Turkish society has changed over the years, with sex and sexuality becoming less of a taboo subject in Turkey, we also started using quite extreme creative executions of this same creative idea, which set us apart from our competitors. The next one, she talks about their approach after 2010. As gender equality gained more and more attention over the years, Axe also felt the need to revisit its own communication strategy. As a result, Axe decided to switch to a much softer communication style after 2010. Since our previous advertisements were often considered to have some sexist elements, we began to pay special attention to gender equality, staying away from gender-specific stereotyping in our communications. However, it was in 2017 that Axe had the biggest shift in its communication strategy, taking the necessary steps to alter its global branding strategy and its consumer perception. This change was the end result of market research studies conducted with men. One such study conducted with 3,500 men across 10 countries in 2017 showed that men were exposed to too many pressures from society. This pressure made them feel obliged to fit in with social norms. As a result, they felt they could not live the lives they wanted to live. Therefore, as a men's brand, we started asking ourselves how we could possibly help to ease this pressure, allowing men to feel free. Part three, Men Cry Too campaign. As a result of all these market research studies, Axe decided to change its slogan to find your magic. What we wanted to say was that manhood has got nothing to do with being handsome or rich or athletic. Instead, we wanted to say that every man is attractive when they find their own magic and when they start acting like themselves. This creative idea had many different executions across different countries. And the uh, third part, she talks about the global campaign and, and the adaptations that they made for the Turkish market. Find Your Magic campaign was executed in many different ways across the globe. When adapting the campaign for Turkey, we did not want to make a direct translation because we thought it would just not have the same effect in Turkish. That's why we did some research on the language used by our core target group, aiming to find something which would give the same message to them more directly. We observed that young men use an expression among themselves, which can be translated into English as, what is your thing? Meaning, what is so special about you? Or what makes you, you? So in our brand relaunch, we used, what is your thing? As our slogan. We also researched the likely pressures that Turkish men face in society and the taboos that they often come across. Then we asked ourselves how we could possibly overcome these barriers and what we could do to make them feel free. We spent a considerable amount of time studying these issues. At the end, we realized that all men were being brought up from a young age with the idea of being strong and staying strong. Being and staying strong is something that all men have experienced in their lives and they can reflect on this concept very easily. For a man to cry or to show his emotions in front of others without hiding it is not considered to be acceptable behavior. On the contrary, it is believed to be a sign of weakness. We even have a well-known song with the words, men do not cry. 
we started asking ourselves how we could possibly act upon this and give them enough courage to be themselves, reflecting their true emotions. In the end, we collaborated with a well-known Turkish singer, Bonomo, and he rewrote the lyrics and adapted the song to be Men Do Cry. The last one is a local campaign uh, that they uh, devised only for Turkey. It is rare to hear brands apologize to their own consumers, but we demonstrated this courage in 2018 and communicated a heartfelt apology to our customers. Over the previous year, we had been getting a lot of consumer complaints about lids breaking too easily. So in our campaign, we said, we heard your complaints about our lids, so we are changing them. Our sincere apologies if we have hurt your feelings. In Turkish, we are able to use a pun as well, the verb kirmak was used for both to hurt your feelings and to break. <laughs> this pun also gave the message much more impact. It was a creative way of addressing both the functional and the emotional problem at the same time. We know that Twitter, especially, is an effective medium for receiving such consumer complaints and responding to them. We had been working on improved packaging for some time, and we were fortunate to have new caps along with our new bottles in 2018. We worked with Bonomo, where he read out loud some nasty tweets we received and answered them in a humorous way, whilst communicating the message about our new improved packaging this was a campaign where we merged the fun element with a functional message from the Axe brand. In the end, we were really proud of the campaign. It is... If we draw a scale, on one side lies total standardization, and at the opposite side lies total adaptation. Each and every company has to find the right mix for itself on the scale. Furthermore, the standardization adaptation mix can change for the same brand from one campaign to the other. It could be so that the same brand can use a totally standard campaign in one instance and then in another campaign they may need to have more adaptations. Therefore, total standardization, total adaptation should be a case-by-case -case decision for brands after carefully considering all the pros and cons. Similarly, we see that AX considering global campaigns one by one and making decisions accordingly. For AX brands launch in Turkey, an international campaign was used in 1980s. However, as we have seen in the case, 2017 Find Your Magic global campaign was adapted to Turkish as What Is Your Thing? and the whole campaign was created all over again with a new execution but following the same communication strategy. Therefore, we can say that Find Your Magic campaign was closer to the total adaptation side on the scale. Then in the follow-up, Sorry If I Hurt Your Feelings campaign, a local campaign was produced to announce their new packaging, putting together rational and emotional functions together. I'm an electronic engineer by training. I was working at the University of Antwerp in the Center for Care Technology, focusing on adapting products for disabled people. A friend and I had a fun idea one evening when we were going out to create an interactive urinal. So we created a place to pee, a urinal equipped with sensors to detect in which direction the person was peeing so they could play games on a screen. That was fun, but we soon ran into problems because the ceramic urinal got dirty 
and the sensor was incapable of properly detecting the direction. So purely out of love for technology, we started to look for a solution. Look, there was a basic technology that we needed to develop into a useful product. So we wrote a technological grant proposal and submitted it to a government grant agency. This was a first validation, given that some experts were going to have a look at our submission and determine whether it was a viable idea. If approved, it would also allow for the necessary financial support to develop this basic technology into an effective product. So we worked almost two years perfecting the technology and making it into a product. We got this idea to start up a business almost by accident. Both Yen and I saw the potential to do some wonderful things with it. We wrote this proposal for a government grant, which we got and we subsequently carried out. That's really how this company started. We first started to develop a sensor for flushing a urinal, which was better than anything on the market. Better means that there are no false flushes, so we are water saving. It is also resistant to vandalism. So we focused on developing a better automatic flushing system for urinals and bring that to market. What this means is that our sensor can detect how dirty the urinal is and how much water is needed to flush. So we developed a sensor which could be attached to an existing urinal. We are the only ones that can detect when an individual starts and stops peeing. This is already a better product than the typical infrared product, which can only detect whether it is somebody in front and when he leaves, so it flushes. But our sensor detects whether the urinal has been used and how dirty it is, adapting the required water to flush. We started this company based on an idea and developed our own technology, so we do our own research and development. As you can see, we have our own lab where we test all electronics and ceramics. We design our own prints and layouts, but we outsource the production of the sensors. We are not a production company, so we subcontract the production to a trusted manufacturing company in Belgium, close to home. The production is designed that way, that our sensors are molded into a resin, which is excellent against any liquids, but also an easy way to protect the product from copying. In terms of sourcing, we have our own production right around the corner, so to speak. We don't do this ourselves. I don't see us doing this ourselves ever. This is not our strong suit. There are other companies that have far better expertise in this regard. We have a business model that is focused on developing the technology and researching and designing the product. But production is not something we will ever do. But we do want to keep this close to home. But obviously, the commercialization and internationalization still had to start.